Okay, we're back for live three o'clock rock uh, here on Life After Statehood with Ray Tsuchiyama, our regular contributor to this important historical discussion of Hawaii. Welcome back, Ray. Thank you very much, Jay, and I love your hat. Uh, you seem very uh, like a gentleman farmer today. Ah, thank you. you. There's a reason for that. Right. Because today we're going to discuss agriculture, more specifically Hawaii, the perfect place for agriculture. Is that really, is that true? You would think so, uh, <laughs> with, with a history of, of sugar and pineapple and, and many other crops. Uh, you would think that Hawaii uh, should be a leader in agriculture. Yeah, that's that's correct. Would. But let's talk about history for a minute. And you mentioned before the show began about the Falls of Clyde <laughs> and this woman from Glasgow who is trying to re re recapture it right. for, for Scotland. Right. Um, and this tells us something because here in Hawaii, we don't care about the Falls of Clyde. They in Glasgow, <laughs> they care. So the question is whether we are appropriately sensitive to the history of our own place, are we? That's a good question, because uh, when you look around, uh, is there a plantation historical museum? For example, uh, you know uh, how, uh, that that people would go to and take their children and see how what the grandparents had to go through. Because when you think about it, uh, the plantation era really was a long time in, in uh, Hawaiian history, starting out like the 1830s and 40s and going on into the 1960s. Actually, it ended perhaps last year with the closing of Maui Pines oh, sure. uh, sugar yeah. uh, uh, plantation in Punene. Yeah. and in fact. Uh, in a uh, camp uh, on Maui was a small virtual town of 10,000, 11,000 people where my grandparents and, and relatives lived out of a population of barely 40 to 45,000 on Maui. And now it's gone, completely yeah. gone. Yeah. It's, it's as if uh, we destroyed it and, yeah. and kind of uh, re re relegated it to the dustbin of history because we are in, in a high-tech tourism-based uh, economy. Yeah. So back in 1850 or so, we had our first immigrants come. They were Chinese, actually. Right. They were coolies. Um, and they were working the land. But the land was not in plantation model, not yet. And it took uh, another 20, 30 years, maybe more, for the capital concentration to be developed so that these guys, uh, former missionaries and the like, uh, could get enough money and power, when they were working on it all the time, uh, to actually build plantations. And the most, the, the largest plantations at the time were built in North Kohala, right. a, a, yeah. along uh, the North Hobby, Kohala coast. Right, right. And they were huge, one after the other. And that was where the model, if you will, was invented up there. Uh, all that cultural and technological stuff that you had to have to make a competitive plantation. Very interesting. And this would be 1890, 1900, 1910. And most of the people, first it was the Japanese, and then the Portuguese came. Right. Not from Portugal per se, you know. Right. It came from uh, the, the Azores, Azores. That's right. right. Very Islands interesting. off of, off very of interesting. Uh, 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 Portugal. But going back in time, you're absolutely right that uh, actually the first crop, uh, uh, a, a cash earner was actually uh, was actually uh, sandalwood when you think about it, mm -hmm. and it was harvested and sent to Hong Kong, other places, to made into furniture, and that was a real cash crop. But that was not a sustainable kind of uh, crop because once you cut it down, <laughs> it, it was gone. Yeah. And it was a, uh, a controlled kind of uh, economy by the Ali, of course, using uh, the lower caste in the Hawaiian society to kind of uh, chop it up and uh, take it away. So by the 1830s and 40s, you're correct, uh, uh, the um, uh, business people from New, uh, from New England who intermarried and intermingled with the missionary families, the Castle and Cooks and, and, and uh, Theos Davies and, and many, many uh, families uh, looked at sugar as, as the big, big crop. Uh, but it, sugar was very water intensive when you think about it. And uh, you're correct that uh, in the 1880s and 90s, uh, like on Maui, uh, there were two cousins, uh, C.W. Dickey and Harry Baldwin. They both attended MIT. Harry Baldwin's major was civil engineering. Ah. 1894, the ah, class of ah, 1894 of that. MIT. Yeah. Think of that as the internet of its time. He comes back, sees the Yale Valley. How do we draw water to the central uh, uh, plains of Maui? And uh, that whole began the process of the canals, and it was a major uh, civil engineering uh, undertaking. So those three things, yeah. you, you had to have, first, you had to have land. That's right. And if you intermarry with people who have land, right. then you wind up with land. Secondly, you had to have money, and right. uh, you get capital, connections right, will give right. you capital. You need 
need that right. to operate. Right. Thirdly, you have to have labor, and we right. had a system for importing labor from Asia that was working, and first it was the Chinese, then it was the Japanese. And I think the Japanese were the plurality, really, over the life of the plantation that's, that's right. model and, of and, the and, workforce And in there. fact, uh, when you say the Azores, uh, Azores, of course, were uh, kind of like the uh, countryside of, <laughs> of Portugal. It wasn't like uh, Lisbon, yeah, Lisboa. You go in, uh, uh, and the early immigrants from Japan were from the Kanto area, Tokyo, Yokohama, that area. Of course, they knew nothing about our agriculture. <laughs> so the sugar planta uh, planters looked at a map and said, well, why don't we draw a line? The, the farthest away from Tokyo and Yokohama should be people who are rooted to the land. Therefore, exactly at the uh, 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 western edge of Honshu, Yamaguchi Prefecture, Hiroshima Prefecture, Fukuoka, my, my wife, grandparents. My wife's yeah. family, Yamaguchi can. That's right. Yeah. And, and of course, Okinawa, but uh, the big one is Kumamoto, uh, Kumamoto Prefecture, uh, where my grandparents came. Yeah. And when Harry Baldwin came back from MIT, he started working on the 1890s, 1900s, and my grandparents arrived at, uh, in, in Kahului Camp, uh, 1907. Uh -huh. So you can see a direct correlation between his investment and the construction of the canals and the sugar uh, 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 coming up and the harvesting. And like you said, the falls of Clyde and that type of ship, we don't uh, have them anymore. They were the lifeblood well, going back and forth. In those uh, days, you know, 1890, 1900, in the early 19th century, you know, the people were moving around the world. It was like right. uh, the, the early globalism, if you will. We don't know too much about globalism right now under this administration. <laughs> but in the old days, there was a lot of globalism happening, and a lot of people were immigrating all over the place. It was a sort of an arbitrage of labor in those days, and the arbitrage here came mostly from, in those days, from Japan. But what I, what I want to add, though, is that we had to have something else, too. We had to have technology. You mentioned it. Uh, engineering for right. the water. We had to know about, you know, plant science. Right. We had to know about that. And therefore, in 1910, when the University of Hawaii was established, what do you think we have? SITAR, the right. College of Tropical, tropical Agriculture. Right. Uh, yep. re, was it tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. I will never, maybe you can help me with this, understand why human resources <laughs> is in the College of Tropical <laughs> Agriculture. But even today, in 2017, it still is. Um, and I guess that's because it was really the College of Plantations, and they both fit in the same the same container, tropical agriculture and human resources. Well, it, that's a very good point, uh, because they needed uh, people to work on the plantations. And of course, when you think about the plantations, it's about growing you know, uh, cane, and you had to really figure out about disease, nem nematodes, insects, all that kind of stuff, including people to look at water quality and, and so forth. So you're, you're right that the early college curriculum probably focused on tropical agriculture of that period. It wasn't on cars. It wasn't on steel making. Yeah. It wasn't on all those areas that <laughs> East Coast colleges were focusing on. It was uh, focusing on how to uh, have a quality uh, uh, harvest and how to ship that harvest uh, to uh, the mainland and other places. So th th that whole ecosystem began to develop, especially in the 20s and 30s. And it was a very, uh, when you talk about culture, uh, Hawaii was a very closed uh, uh, society back then. And uh, it, the governor was appointed. It was a territory of Hawaii. And of course, there was a small uh, um, you know, uh, ecosystem or, or, or a group of families that really controlled life. Yeah, yeah. It was very hierarchical also. You can only go back on that very point. You know, So now we had the takeover, the, thro the overthrow, right, 1893. 1893. All right, now this changed things. Because now there wasn't a monarchy anymore. It was a bunch of howly businessmen right. uh, who some of whom had intermarried. So they could get the ships, they could get the money, right. they could get the land, they could put it together, and they formed that group, that, right. um, that the big five. The well, big what, society, yeah. a closed society, yeah. a very hierarchical right. society. And query whether the plantation system could have developed to the extent it did had that not happened. Seemed to me that that laid, you know, the groundwork for the development of this hierarchical arrangement where you could own large plantations and operate them and get all the elements you needed and make them make them profitable. And they were profitable for a long, long time. They built the state, really. That's right. And, and they were always looking at centralization. A lot of institutions still continue, like the school board and why there isn't a mayor of, of, of Pearl City or Lihui, uh, you know, yeah, Lihui. Yeah. 
yeah, when you think yeah, about yeah. it, or uh, you know, Kahui, uh, the county system is very weak. Uh, the uh, uh, state is omnipresent in taxes and, and so forth, emanating from Oahu. And uh, you're correct that in the 20s and 30s, uh, something else happened, though, that uh, laid the seeds to uh, really destroy the plantation system after the uh, And that was, number one, education, public education. In the 20s and 30s, many, many teachers came to teach at uh, Oahu, or, or, or where my father went to Maui High School in Hamakopoko, who were like, like the Peace Corps of its day. People from Michigan, <laughs> from Washington State, from Stanford, yeah, yeah, from the yeah. East Coast, like from Teach Dagmar. for America, the same yes, thing. Yes, yeah. very similar. Uh, my father had uh, um, English, math, Latin. They studied uh, uh, Shakespeare. He has, his best friend was called Cassius from Julius Caesar. They had proms. They had, and they were like, uh, and they went home, but their parents spoke no English. It's so interesting. Yeah, my grandparents. It was the spoke, Americanization yeah, of the right. plantation population, right. is what it was. And and they and they were laying the seeds for an easy kind of uh, uh, kind of thing because in in the neighbor islands, especially the uh, plantations uh, had the judges, the police, and so forth. It was more like a police state when you think about it. You could not go and get a job at the big five company. Alex, you couldn't go. Uh, they weren't hiring Japanese at that point, even though you went to the University of Hawaii. But what changed everything was the war. The war in 1941, Pearl Harbor comes, and that allowed the Nisei, uh, my father's generation, to uh, suddenly see gay Paris. <laughs> they saw New York. They saw uh, Germany. They, they were uh, at the same level as any other soldier in the U.S. Army, and they found out something else, that they knew as much or even more than people from Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama. So this transformed their minds and, and a already... A level of confidence a, now. A, a huge, what we would call in retrospect, consciousness building. In yeah, a, in a way. yeah. So they come back in the late 40s and uh, they see a system where it's it's like coming, uh, you know, uh, going to the UK for education, coming back to Johannesburg, you know, in, in the yeah. 70s and 80s, yeah. uh, and, and seeing uh, that it, it's not sustainable. Com coming back from yeah, coming back from the war really right. was uh, an amazing experience for them because they had distanced themselves. They had now they could understand it, you know, with a, a much greater clarity. But let me let me take you back to the 30s for a okay. moment. You know, your father was on a plantation. Right. My wife's parents were on right. a plantation. And, and the question is, you know, what was life like there? I mean, you were at the bottom of the hierarchical right. totem pole. Um, you, didn't work for, you didn't get paid very much. The work was physical. And yet, a great culture was developed, right. uh, particularly around the Japanese culture. And, I mean, when some of these old folks talk about life on the plantation, they talk about it in sweet terms. Right. They well, had I a mean, wonderful time, they had yeah. a social experience that they still carry around today. Now, what was so good about well, it? Well, uh, you have to understand that when my grandparents left, they left a, uh, a, a, a place that uh, in Kumamoto or Hiroshima that had an overpopulation. Mm -hmm. uh, there was not enough land. Uh, uh, I would guarantee that the males who came to Hawaii for Japan were never the first son. <laughs> there were the third or fourth sons who couldn't inherit the land. Uh, so uh, Japan was 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 uh, going through a population boom, yeah. and and uh, a lot of things that would lead to war in China and Manchuria and, and other places uh, came out of that uh, kind of a uh, uh, families that had five six children were the norm in those days. So, uh, and so when they came to the plantation, first the plantation uh, really took care of everything. The house was, you know, they could live in for cheaply. Uh, they had a canteen. Uh, they had, uh, and, and they could buy things on cheap. They, had a, 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 they could get credit on the stores. They had a hospital at the plantation. Uh, they had, you know, education through the schools. Uh, Take it, care of everything. Yeah, when you it think was about in it, local yeah. parentis. It, you don't need a mayor right. if you have a plantation manager, you know? And it also, <laughs> yeah, it, it led to uh, what well, we don't understand that well, but I, I think it also led to a cultural ethnic mixing. Uh, they, uh, they had what was it, the cow cow tin. Everybody had a tin that they would bring to uh, lunch, and it was uh, food inside, and they would share this. Sharing. Portuguese uh, right. food, uh, uh, Japanese right. food, Chinese food. Right. And you could see in the uh, in 20s and 30s the breakdown ethnicity and then the, the uh, acculturation of becoming Hawaii, uh, more of the Hawaii. It was building Hawaii. a great culture. Yeah. It was building the culture we have today. Let's, uh, that is remarkable and important. Like a 
break, okay. a quick break, Ray. That's Ray Tsuchiyama. We're here on uh, Life uh, After Statehood, although we talk about before statehood, too. <laughs> We're talking about Hawaii, the perfect place for agriculture. <laughs> You'll see. We'll come back and we'll talk about more about how this culture on the plantations invented the special Hawaii culture. Aloha, this is Kelee Akina with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, and I'm inviting you to navigate the journey. We are discussing the end of life options. And we would really love to have you every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. right here. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward. And the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper to bumper traffic. And this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon and let's move Hawaii forward. Bingo, we're back with Ray Tsuchiyama here on Life After Statehood, talking about Hawaii, the perfect place for agriculture, a study of how the, the agriculture has evolved or not in the state of Hawaii. So I wanted to ask you, uh, we, you know, we talked about the, the way various cultures would mix, which was actually a beautiful thing. I mean, it is one of the best things about Hawaii. We are the original, the perfect melting pot. It's remarkable, it's lovable, it is our essence. <clears throat> but then, you know, when I came here, which was in the 60s, people talked about the plantation mentality. This was not necessarily a good thing. What is the plantation mentality? What are the characteristics of it? That's a very good question. And uh, because, um, uh, when you lived in a plantation, remember you uh, began your day by uh, a blast of uh, a, hoot, a hooting horn yeah. somewhere on the plantation. A steam whistle. <laughs> yeah. And then at the end of the day, there was another whistle. <laughs> and it reminds you like 1984 kind of thing, but, <laughs> but it, it was a, a regular kind of life that, uh, and, and, uh, uh, that you didn't, uh, and it forced you not to look outside uh, the plantation. Everything you had was inside. Uh, ideas, oh, they, they were, uh, you know, uh, nothing, but they, they were like uh, horrifying <laughs> to, to the uh, big five and, and the uh, ruling elite. So uh, it, it, they tried to suppress education, they tried to suppress learning about the world, which, uh, which oddly and paradoxically, the public schools uh, enlightened young people to learn about uh, uh, the, the world and so forth. But you're right, the plantation mentality is not to accept new things, uh, you know, and, and uh, not to be innovative, kind of, and to accept things as they are. Uh, th and that continued on into the, even into the 60s, uh, you know, uh, you would have Japanese uh, coming to companies, do you hire Japanese? The, the first question, uh, because they were, in co you know, propagandized or in their mindset that uh, you could not get a job if you were a Japanese at a, at a uh, bank or insurance company. And that's why a separate ethnic uh, uh, network of banks and finance companies and and stores and so forth just evolved, uh, you know, uh, in parallel. But that hierarchical thing was part of the plantation. Um, that, that, what do you want to call it, uh, ra racial discrimination right. was part of the plantation. And it took us a while to figure out how to get out of that, but it was not sustainable. Oh, yes. Uh, as, you know, when, the, when these guys came back from the war with new ideas, new thoughts, new fresh air, <clears throat> they were not going to tolerate that going forward. But, they but, were going to leave the plantation. That's right. That's right. And, and, and that's exactly so when you look at the 54 elections. And that comes after a series of very, uh, 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 very, um, a tumultuous strikes in the late 40s, ILWU, and, and the uh, uh, workers began to uh, really agitate for higher wages, better living conditions, and ways to get out of the plantation, live outside the plantation. In the late 40s were very violent in many ways, leading up to 54, the elections, and then comes all the uh, uh, 442nd veterans, the, the Nadao Yoshinagas, Daniel Inoue, Tadao Beppu, uh, and the others like Elmer Cavalli, Patsy Mink, who came out of Maui also. And this 
would go and, and, and uh, uh, bring in John Burns, of course, and, uh, who had another vision of society. All the people came in. If you asked them, uh, would you like to continue the plantation of society to uh, Dan, uh, Danny Noe and others, <laughs> they would just go, go ballistic. <laughs> that, that was not the It future. meant a bad thing. Yes, a that's bad right. Thing. That's right. At that time, because they all wanted to work in an air-conditioned office. So, I mean, it was a very <laughs> physical, demanding, uh, with no, uh, if, it was not a uh, career, <laughs> you know, uh, ascending kind of uh, work. It was just, uh, just did. It just didn't evolve into um, other other companies uh, or other innovations. So, so, so as so, a result, yeah. people came from the neighbor islands to the city, to uh, Oahu, to Honolulu. Um, they did not uh, have any long-term regard for agriculture. Right. They wanted to get right. away from it. <clears throat> and uh, I guess uh, uh, the neighbor islands changed because that's where the agriculture was in large part. Uh, and maybe they they lost something in the process. I mean, we got exactly what we wanted. No agriculture. <laughs> well, uh, you, you, uh, I, I, I say this, uh, that, that it surprises people. From 1945 to the late 70s, the population of Maui was static. It lost people. Uh, there were people born on Maui, but they all moved to yeah. uh, to Honolulu yeah. because there, there were no jobs other yeah, than yeah. On sugar uh, yeah. uh, on Maui. So you know, to uh, going to banking, the UH, uh, federal jobs, uh, Pearl Harbor jobs, uh, insurance. They, you had to move to Honolulu, yeah. and so the neighbor islands experienced. Uh, I'll give another example of a place, Kona. In in the late 50s, early 60s, the entire Japanese population of Kona uh, moved to Honolulu because the uh, utter failure of the coffee uh, plantations there. So you have what is called in Honolulu the Kona Club. There is a very interesting society where they still meet together. Their grandparents came from Kona, <laughs> but they, have, they don't, haven't been to Kona, but they're like a Kenjinkai. They're a prefecture organization from a neighbor island living in Honolulu. So uh, there, there are these uh, waves of people who had another migration to Honolulu uh, after coming to Kona for, for coffee. But then you're absolutely right that, that the, uh, uh, the numbers of Japanese and so forth uh, did not increase after the war. So Maui, uh, especially Kona and others, changed uh, because of mainland uh, migration. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we should not not mention the Filipinos. Right, the Filipinos right, right. came in the 20s. Gotcha. They were the wave after the Japanese, after a couple of Japanese waves, and they populated these plantations for what, and 40, they still, 40 years? They, and they were still coming in the 70s and 80s. Yes, that's 90s, true. Uh, right, and, right. and they were still working on Lanai when, uh, you know, you have Japanese families there uh, who were from uh, uh, Lanai before the war, but they all left and the uh, Filipinos replaced them. They were continue to be on Maui, for example, Punene and so forth. And then in the 60s and the 70s, uh, it appeared that these events, that is coming off the plantations, uh, a need to get away from the plantation structure, uh, get away from agriculture as, as physical labor, um, and the change in the state uh, made, made, made yeah. what, it, what it created, I think, um, was a was a was a, a wasteland, a Sahara, all over the neighbor islands. The population left. There were no jobs, and then it was up to the central state government to try to fix it for the people who were left behind. That was hard. You're actually right. And and other thing is that the plantations tried to change themselves. Now, the, the, uh, there was a Hawaii Sugar Planters uh, Association lab in Halaba for 50 years. They were trying to find other products, value-added products, other than basic sugar. That was uh, the price determined in the Chicago Mercantile someplace. And they failed. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, they went into rum, they went into biomass, there were many, many things. That uh, uh, sugar, but you couldn't compete on from the Philippines or beet sugar, Brazil, Europe. I mean, just couldn't compete, uh, and and you could see the writing on the wall. And and I, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, even Dole in in the late uh, in early 70s had an innovation of its time. It was canned pineapple in its own juice. You could see that it, 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 they weren't going into uh, export markets and so forth. It's, it was doomed uh, as, as a, because of cheaper products coming in from around the world. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about pineapple. You know, um, the big pineapple plant uh, down there in uh, Ibele, yeah, Ibele, yeah. Uh, with the big pineapple, right, right. and everybody would come in from the airport and right. say, you know, did you hear they're going to take the big pineapple down? And really, are they? Yeah, yeah. it's ripe. It got ripe. <laughs> that was the joke. For decades, <laughs> it was the joke. 
But anyway, I mean, where did that come in, Ray? And, and what role did that play in trying to preserve the plantation system? Well, I, I, and the, the, the planters, uh, executives uh, worked with uh, tropical agriculture. Uh, they worked with many, many uh, uh, organizations and within scientists. But they, they, they tried to uh, get to a place where they could retain that plantation system uh, and so forth. But you could see the writing on, on the wall that it was not producing products. But however, recently, there's been uh, uh, labs like on Maui, there's a uh, in a food and innovation lab that just opened on Maui that was trying to bring people, entrepreneurs and farmers, to create some kind of new product for export. That is a new thing, like uh, deer jerky or a guava-based jam or a uh, stew that could be uh, vacuum packed. Don't forget papaya. Uh, papayas or something uh, uh, on bread food. Uh, and and um, all these products we would think would, could have been exported out and, and earning uh, revenues for the state. But we've had a trouble, I think, because uh, of, uh, of scale, of, of uh, trying to uh, make products and then the Japanese like it, well, it was, oh, send us you know 100,000 cases of this. It's hard to scale up. Uh, we don't have that kind of uh, scaling abilities anymore. But mm -hmm. the other thing that I wanted to just state, you know, today in uh, Star Advertiser, we're talking about 8.9 million visitors. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a big number. Uh, but remember why these people come. And there's there's a a, a, a kind of a uh, uh, thing in the American consciousness of Elvis Presley in Blue Hawaii, and the uh, and the Hundreds of acres of, of uh, you know, uh, flow in the pineapple and the waves of sugarcane. Remember that? Sure. That was the kind of uh, the kind of Hawaii that people expected and still expect when they come to Hawaii. And I think people are very uh, will be very surprised that we don't have agriculture anymore. Uh, am I correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, and they don't get out there yeah. to see what's right. going on in Mililani. So the result is they they go, they come, and they go, yeah. and they still think there's waves. Right. And fields and, and cane sugar and, and right. pineapple all out there is not there anymore. Yeah, it's an illusion. But, yeah. it's, but tourism in Hawaii is built on that illusion is. of that movie, which was a spectacular movie, also revered by Japanese who yeah. come here. Yeah. But but it's a it's a complete now illusion. Uh, the, the, uh, so here we are to look at the present. You know, sitar still exists. Uh, there is a certain amount of science going on. There's a lot of entrepreneur mentoring and, uh, you know, all that to try to get young people out of college to be farmers. It's, it hasn't really taken, but there's a lot of effort going into oh, yes. it. Um, and I really, you know, I think it's very important that we get back to the land. How can you talk about the environment without farming? How can you talk about being sustainable without creating your own food supply? Uh, but we haven't yet done that. And I really wonder whether, you know, the rejection of of, you know, dirt under your fingernails, a rejection of the hierarchical plantation system is still with us and is still limiting us from going back to the land and doing modern diversified agriculture. Uh, you may be completely right. Uh, you see very few children, you know, saying, you know, I want to be a farmer <laughs> when they grow up. Uh, in seventh grade at Kalakaua Intermediate, uh, I learned uh, uh, weeding, and, and we were it still taught some agriculture in the late 60s uh, back then. Uh, however, uh, no one no one was thinking of joining a plantation. Very, very few people uh, of that time uh, were actually, uh, you know, having a ob career objective going into agriculture. We have to discuss this further. Okay. Uh, every Thursday we have a show on uh, Hawaii farming, but you and I have to discuss exactly what the social historical context is. Ray Tsuchiyama, Life After Statehood, here in Hawaii, the perfect place for agriculture. Aloha. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Great hat.